Hello book lovers and welcome to Book Talk Radio Club. My name is Claire Perkins and today I'm talking to Paul Bradley. Paul is the author of the Andalusian mystery series set in his adopted country Spain. Paul blames his Andalusian mystery series on Iron Squid. Otherwise he'd be stuck in London failing at this, that and the other. Okay, let's find out some more. Hello Paul, welcome and thank you for coming to talk to me on Book Talk Radio Club. Well, thanks for inviting me. It's great to be here. My pleasure. Okay, Iron Squid. What has Iron Squid got to do with crime mysteries? <laughs> One of the first memories most British visitors have of Spain is lunch on the beach. Yep. Uh, even, even today, some of the food translations remain a source of amusement. But 30 years ago, long before Google Translate came into being, they, they were hilarious. This was mainly because the translators were the restaurant owners' kids. They were learning rudimentary English at school, and somehow the owner of the restaurant thought that qualified them to interpret complete, complex Spanish menus into into English. And one that's always stuck with me is iron squid, which should have been grilled squid, of course. <laughs> Lovers of Spanish cuisine will know that as calamares are the plancha, and actually, there is some logic in the error. La plancha can mean, can mean grill and also iron. Another one lurking in my grain cells was, was rape a la marinera, which was translated translated as rape the sailor, when it, when it should have said monkfish with seafood. <laughs> in, in, in themselves, these dodgy translations had absolutely nothing to do with crime mysteries. However, Offering a service to Spanish businesses that polished the quality of their communications to foreigners was the key that unlocked the gate for me to a working life here. Right. I sat the Iron Squid restaurant owner down and went through his menu, pointing out what he was actually offering his English speaking customers. He was horrified. <laughs> he, he remonstrated with his kids and, uh, and, uh, and then asked me to put it right for him, which I did. And then, of course, his neighbour wanted the same, and that grew into a small business, which eventually led to guidebooks, lifestyle magazines, and then ultimately into crime writing. Love it. And does that, I mean, that just actually got me. That made me laugh, really laugh. I love that iron squid. So, ha so having put the owner of the restaurant right about his translation gaffe, you moved to Neja, Spain, and then started writing crime mysteries. Was this something you had in your mind to do, writing that is, not moving to Spain all along, and why crime mysteries in particular? Originally I had no plans at all to write anything other than what was needed for translations uh, and then the guidebooks and, uh, and ultimately a, a lifestyle magazine. But as the years plodded by and my knowledge of Spain accumulated as I travelled extensively around the country gathering material and photographs for the travelogues that went into the magazine, I'd return to Nerha and find that, as usual, nothing had happened in my absence. It's a quiet, safe town with practically zero crime. But then in 2008, a, a young girl was murdered outside the church uh, in broad daylight. Uh, to us residents, this was a horrendous shock, and it dominated the, the chit-chat for, for weeks. Mm. Eventually, after the killer had been caught, had been incarcerated, never returned, everything returned to its customary level of inactivity, this murder sat heavily on my mind. It rather sort of uh, destroyed my original concept of you know, living my life in, in a quiet, safe town. Mm. Now, now we had a murder on our hands. But, and from that sort of uh, thinking process uh, emerged the idea to base a crime story here in Nerha. It, it hadn't been done before, uh, yet the town was an extremely popular holiday resort, wedding venue and film location. People used Sophie and Lorraine starred here 50 odd years ago. Mm. So I thought surely tourists would enjoy revisiting a place in a book where they had fond memories. Yeah. So I thought, you know, but I'd never written a book before, so I thought, well, I'd better seek some advice. Thankfully, Nerha is a town full of all kinds of uh, uh, strange uh, people from all over the world. And, and in this respect, just around the corner from me, there was a, uh, a gentleman, he was getting on in years a bit, but he'd 
published over 50 books in his life. He, he was English, uh, but he lived here since the 1960s, brought up his sons here, who are still here today. And um, his name was Drew Lawney. Uh, his claim to fame was that uh, he wrote the script for uh, Yes, We Have No Pajamas, the one of the first naked plays in the Whitehall Theatre in, in uh, or the Windmill Theatre in, in London. Yeah. He, wrote, he went on to write books, some of them based around here, but also all kinds of different types of books. So I, I, we, I sat him down with a glass of wine and we, we had a long chat. And uh, he agreed to help me. Uh, and uh, so we, we began and didn't really have a sort of planning some kind of what should we write about. So we thought, well, you know, let's write about something, something to do with crime, mm. something you know, about murder, you know, based around the heart of our town centre, which is the, called the Balcon de Europa. Uh, and, um, and and it all started from there, really. S sadly, though, he, he died about a year later, which set me back a bit. Uh, but I persevered, and from those efforts and the help of my test readers and uh, uh, my editor, uh, evolved the uh, first book of the Andalusian Mystery Series. Now, well, let's talk about each of the four books then. So starting with book number one, Darkness in Malaga, would you like to give Book Talk Radio Club's listeners a brief synopsis of the story? Well, Darkness in Malaga, let, let me put it into some kind of concept. You know, Malaga is a town uh, the, at the bottom of Spain, on, uh, facing Africa. It's a beautiful, beautiful location. Uh, and... It's, you know, it's got some fantastic beaches, and often when I go and sit on the beach listening to the haunting cries of seagulls echoing around the cliffs and look out to the sea, I can sometimes see the mountains uh, of Morocco. Mm -hmm. Occasionally, I also see a small boat landing packed with illegal immigrants seeking a better life. Uh, as I watch them uh, hoisted off no normally by the police because they've been watching the river for about an hour before they've actually landed, uh, I often wonder what motivated them to take such a dangerous and often fruitless journey. Mm. That, did they make something of themselves or were they sent straight back? Many, of course, disappear into underground slave labour, but there are still hundreds of them, are, of them visible on the street, peddling fake watches, etc., around the streets and bars. Uh, and I ask myself, how did one make an honest living as an illegal immigrant? Their destinies gave me the idea for Darkness in Malaga. So having put that in context, as the first of, the, of what was going to be a series, uh, Darkness in Malaga introduces the main characters. I make no apology that Spain is one of them. It is an incredibly beautiful country with warm and friendly people and provides a paradisical setting for my stories. Detective Inspector Leon Prado of the Spanish National Police is baffled by the increasing number of foreign girls being abducted and illegal immigrants disappearing from their detention centers. He is so desperate to find the culprits that he makes a mistake in a kidnapping case and a young girl is feared killed. Regrettably, he is demoted to run a new department for crimes involving foreigners. For this, he needs volunteer translators, as there is no budget for full-time staff. On his first case involving the death of a French woman, he meets linguist Philip Armitage, an ex-British soldier who runs an online guide to Spain. Then one of Philip's friends disappears at the San Isidro Festival in Noha. Her abduction is inadvertently filmed by an American videographer who shows the video to Prado. Her name is Amanda Salisbury. The three join forces and track down the culprits. While the crime is solved eventually, and the main antagonist is behind bars, it becomes obvious that this person has not been working alone. Mm. Thus, it leaves the door open for the next book. D.I. Leon Prado, what kind of character is he? What kind of man is he? Prado is the eldest son of a postman from Cordoba. He's in his early 50s and heading toward retirement after a lifetime leading the serious crime squad in Malaga. He's a focused, dogged and wily veteran 
who has put his job before everything, everything, including his marriage. He lives on his own in a tiny flat near the Commissariat in the city centre, has mm. few friends and no life outside of work. Right. He's hoping that this new job can change all that to something better. Meanwhile, he's a lonely old soul suffering from mild depression and the occasional binge with a whiskey bottle. <laughs> So whilst it's uh, uh, Prado is, if you like, um, a, a sort of like the consequence of a traditional old cop or old detective, he's also I'm giving him the opportunity to uh, to evolve into something a bit more modern and a bit more up to date. Did you base his character on another fictional DI, or did he just spring to life, as it were? Uh, it seems to be a trend among writers to make protagonists as emotionally disturbed as their antagonists. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> for, for me, I, I, know, so I, I suddenly find myself watching some of these, uh, or reading some of these books or watching some of these series, and, I, and I'm, I'm lost. There's just too much going on. Mm. I don't know whether it's because I'm a doddering old idiot, but I, I, I just, if I feel like that, I'm sure a lot of other, other people do too. Yeah. Uh, so I, I found that you know, complicated plots are uh, they're not only difficult to write because you're constantly battling with the backstory uh, uh, and trying to fit in with the main theme. I, I feel that readers need a degree in quantum physics to fathom out what's going on. Uh, whereas I prefer more traditional whodunits where good and evil are more readily identifiable. identifiable. Mm. Prado, Philip and Amanda might be lonely souls dedicated to their work but they are not one step away from the lunatic asylum. Also, I'm not much of a fantasist, so I find it difficult to conjure up something from nothing. Right. I write what I know, and I try to keep everything down to earth and plausible. Uh, so all the characters are based on a mixture of real people I have met during my life. Right. Perhaps you might be in the next one. <laughs> Good luck. <laughs> Have you found that as you write each of the Andalusian mystery series books that um, Prado becomes more of a rounded character or did he start off that way with book one, Darkness in Malaga? I'm frankly not that contrived or forward thinking and, and prefer spontaneity whilst I write. While I have a picture in my mind of each individual and each scene, uh, I very much let the writing take care of the detail. Hmm. Uh, and I, I, I actually deliberately set out that their characteristics would evolve with the series. So the reader grows to like or dislike them a little more with each instalment. Right. And your second book, Darkness in Ronda, is set in the world of bullfighting. What happens? Well, d uh, let, me, let me start with, um, again, part of... Uh, why I wrote about bullfighting. In my, in my travel experiences, I actually give lectures about bullfighting. Okay. Um, not that I've become an expert in bullfighting, but I do the lecture with a bullfighter. He's retired now, mm -hmm. um, but he doesn't speak much English, so I do his translating. So we've become a bit of a double act. Mm -hmm. uh, he does all of the uh, gesticulations and the movements, and I do all the words. <laughs> Uh, and, and he's actually a descendant of one of Spain's oldest bullfighting family, the Romero family. Yeah. And um, so I thought, well, I'd actually use his family uh, to uh, in the book uh, to keep it again as near to reality as possible. Mm. So, so I thought of a young man, a young new, newly qualified bullfighter called Diego Romero. Uh, he's again one of the Romero family. And he's listening to what's actually going on in the marketplace, and, and he knows that um, bullfighting is, is dying. And he's determined to modernize it by taking the blood out of the sport. Right. Uh, but the Royal Torino Society, which basically consists of old white men, uh, they control everything that goes on in the bull rings. They, of course, are determined to keep it like it is. Mm. This, this conflict grows progressively divisive and eventually comes to a head in uh, at La Goyesca. Uh, La Goyesca is an amazingly stylish event where everybody dresses uh, in the style of the painter Goya, 
mm. the colours and fashions mm -hmm. of that time. And this all takes place in a, in a mountain village called Rondo, which is almost the home of traditional bullfighting as it is in the current style. Uh, and uh, so, so again, it brings a real city with a real festival to life uh, in a sort of imaginary situation. Uh, and uh, this uh, conflict comes to a head at this particular uh, festival, uh, and uh, which is held in Rondo every September. But at the same time, Prado and uh, Amanda and Philip uncover dark off forces at work in the background mm -hmm. of the conflict between the bullfighter and, uh, and the society uh, to uh, disguise the, their own illegal activities. And the story is about the revealing of those illegal activities, which, which are, of course, related to the, uh, the first book. Mm -hmm. So the series starts then to build. So whilst you don't really know that this is a series, each book leads you to suddenly recognising that it is. Right, right. And then we go on to the third one, and then we go on to the fourth one, and it becomes clearer and clearer with every book. But it's very much told through the revelations of the police investigations rather than the uh, antagonists. Bullfighting is such an abhorrent uh, practice for so many people. I mean, it's still so popular in Spain. I remember when I was a kid and my mum and dad used to take me on holiday there, you couldn't move for excursions to see a bullfight, along, of course, with a watered-down jug of sangria. <laughs> uh, and, and a pop into the brandy factory on the way That's there. That's right, yeah, exactly. <laughs> no, I, actually went to, I actually went on one of those in my first trip when I was in 1964, whatever it was, 1964. Uh, and, but these were actually mock bullfights. Mm. Uh, they, they weren't proper ones. Uh, they... They use mature calves, probably half the size of a of a full size bull, and they were aimed purely at tourists. So you had the job of the torero was basically to keep the the calf from doing any damage to the tourists. So tourists actually were invited after their glass of sangria to come and be the bullfighter. <laughs> so they kitted you up with a hat and a cape, and uh, and, uh, and they got the calf to charge at him, and and they. And, and of course, the, the guy would fall over or run away, and it was it was a bit like a Charlie Chaplin comedy, really. <laughs> there wasn't any blood or any, or any 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 injuries other than people injuring themselves when they tripped up onto the sand. And at the end of the day, they were there to flog you a plethora of sombreros, lovely donkeys, and of course, fruity brandy. Oh my God, I've forgotten about those donkeys. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, they be these these people used to literally have you know these huge donkeys under their arms That's as they. Uh, as they join the queue to get back onto the plane. That's and right. back to I remember. I it's remember. Just amazing. <laughs> but back then, the real bullfights were all sold out to sold out to locals uh, so far in advance. There's no tourist could still had a chance to, to, to get in them. Let's go back. Uh, right. But today, bull, today, though, bullfighting is dying out fast in Spain. Right. However, by reading reading the Spanish press, you wouldn't think so. Officialdom still has its head in the sand when it comes to accepting reality. They, they, they're preferring to project the image of a thriving tradition. In the case of La Goyesca, for example, they are right. It is sold out years in advance because it's a fantastic occasion of which bullfighting is just a small part. The horse displays are hugely popular there. Nowadays, most bullfrings are used less often and usually forever smaller and aging crowds. Young people just aren't interested other than being dragged along by their family for a social outing. Mm. I, I, I do understand, however, why bureaucracy takes this stance. The truth is that over 200,000 jobs are at stake in the bullfighting industry right. in a country that already had, suffers from exceptionally high unemployment. And all these jobs are family businesses who own vast tracts of farming land dedicated to breeding Toro de Lidia. Toro de Lidia is the breed of cattle used for fighting bulls in Spain. Let's go. Sorry, I'm going to interrupt you there, Paul. But let's just go on to book three now, and then and talk about Darkness in Vallejo, Malaga. That's set okay. in that's set in the world of flamenco. I love flamenco. Tell me more about that. Well, uh, flamenco is traditionally uh, um, known for uh, as a gypsy dance. Uh, and again, stop me if I, I I bang on about this because obviously I got wrapped up in all of these things. It's <laughs> part of the research for doing the, these books. Uh, but uh, we're very, very blessed that, the, 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 there are, we have one of the few towns in the, in the, in the near, nearby here uh, that still has a thriving gypsy community. 
So therefore, flamenco still thrives in the town centre, mm. whereas uh, in most places now, the gypsies can't afford to live in the town centre, and therefore it's been shoved out and it's fading and disappearing, which is which is awful. Yes. But there's a town called Veles Malaga, is is the principal town of La Axarquia. It's a beautiful mountainous area to the east of Malaga, similar to Tuscany. It has a population of about 65,000, makes its living as a distribution centre for the fruit and vegetables grown in the area. Its history goes back to beyond Phoenicians, and there are more monuments per square mile there than in Toledo, which is just a, a well-known tourist uh, place. Um, the gypsy communities still churn out on a regular basis to perform juegas. A juega is a impromptu flamenco show of the highest quality. Uh, you're just sitting in a local bar and suddenly these gypsies walk in and start playing. They also do a bit of drinking while they're there and you're mm. expected to fill up their, their envelope as they pass it around. Uh, in, so I decided to create, to use this environment uh, for Darkness in Valley for the, for the third installment in the, in the series. And it starts with uh, the main protagonist, uh, Salome Mendoza, who's a famous flamenco dancer receives a letter asking her to attend a solicitor's office in Vélez town centre to unravel her birth history. She'd been adopted just after birth and had no idea of her roots. She asks her old university roommate, best friend Amanda Salisbury, to accompany her. She goes, they meet the lawyer, and then suddenly they disappear. When Prado doesn't hear from them, he gets worried and sends out a search party and discovers yet another link in the unravelling saga. Hmm. And the most recently published book in the series is Darkness in Granada and was published at the beginning of this year. D.I. D. Leon Prada needs some help from a famous artist, Pablo Picasso, from the private collection of a reclusive American mistress exiled in Granada City. Seven of his muse paintings are to be exhibited in the magnificent Alhambra Palace. They haven't been seen in public for over 30 years. This is the final book in the Andalusian mystery series? It's the climax of these of this particular case, right. as it were. Whilst there have been each, the four books, there have been four separate cases, but they've all been linked. And this book, if you like, um, clears up all the outstanding threads right. with, our, with, our, uh, with our antagonists and their motivation, motivations are revealed in the, in the beautiful settings of the Alhambra Palace and the ski slopes of the Sierra Nevada. Right. Well, they, are, they are, as I said, a series, but do people have to read them in, in a particular order to enjoy them, or can they be read as standalones? They can be read as standalones, as each book has one crime that is resolved. Mm. But to, it is linked to the next book, and to gain maximum enjoyment, it, it's best that they're read in, in numerical order. Right. So who is the target audience for your crime novels, would you say? I would say lovers of Spain and, and those that enjoy a more traditional mystery, uh, but in an exotic setting where you don't need to be a rocket scientist to work out what's going on. <laughs> will there be any more books set in Spain or is that it? There will be a standalone case um, following that. I'm writing it now. It's uh, called Darkness in Cordoba mm -hmm. uh, and it's set in that beautiful city around Easter time. Uh, I might do a couple more after that, but then I want to I move on to, to something else. I've, for example, I've co-written a memoir with America's first female disabled judge, which is currently being edited. Okay. I, th I thoroughly enjoyed the process of drawing her out of the courtroom and into people's minds, and would like to try more of those, just as a, as a change. Let's talk a bit more about you, Paul. So you've lived in Spain for 30 years now and published a lifestyle magazine for the Costa del Sol, along with guidebooks and travel logs in English, German and Spanish. You've lectured about living in Spain and bullfighting, but you are keen to emphasise that you have never dressed in a tight, fancy suit or waved a pink cape at anyone, especially if they weighed 600 kilos and carried a sharp pair of horns. Can't say I blame you. What has kept you there for this length of time? The weather, the lifestyle, what is it? Well, as I said earlier, we came here in 1964. My parents um, bought a villa in Menorca in 1971 or two, uh, and then came to Nurka here in 1987, and we all bought a house here together then. Right. Uh, and uh, I vowed to come back eventually, uh, and did so in uh, about 1990. 
Right. Uh, my sister is also here with her husband and, uh, and children, and now grandchildren. Nice. Uh, and um, so, you know, uh, and I've made my life here, basically. It's not just a sort of a, a relationship as a holiday resort. Mm. And more recently, you say educated groups of posh American and Canadian alumni have enjoyed your tour director services, apart from the terrible jokes and occasional temporarily mis misplaced client. I love it. Where do you take them? Well, well, uh, well I, hope they have, I, hope they have, I hope they enjoyed the terrible jokes as well. But the, <laughs> uh, I think where I don't I take them would probably be a shorter answer. Okay. Um, there's two options. We either base ourselves in a hotel for a week to ten days and take bus rides every day to surrounding areas. Mm. Or we stay in a city for two to three days and see that city uh, and uh, do it in some detail. And we have a, a lecturers come and tell us about the history of Spain. And, uh, and we have blue badge guides from that city take us around its, uh, its attractions. Oh, that's interesting. You have great reviews for your books, including gripping story that keeps your interest until the end. And a captivating, colourful mystery by an author well versed in its setting. Also, an exciting and talented new literary voice in an ever popular genre. Darkness in Malaga proves a discerning read and is recommended without reservation. Paul, are you motivated to write from the reviews you receive or the sales of the books? I write for pleasure, although I'm never satisfied with what I've written next one will always be better. If people buy them, it signals they like what I do. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's what motivates me. If it makes me a bit of money, then fine. If it doesn't, then so be it. Lastly, where can Book Talk Radio Cups listeners purchase the Andalusian Mystery Series? They're in ebook and print format on most major online retailers. Uh, and I've recently published a large print and hardback version of Darkness in Malaga. On, uh, on Amazon. Right. Uh, and if, if they want more detail on that, they can visit my, and then on each book, they can visit my website at paulbradley.eu. Okay, well, thank you, Paul. Please come back on Book Talk Radio Club again. I'd love to chat with you and hear how you're getting on. In the meantime, good luck for the future, thank and thank you, everyone, for listening to Book Talk Radio Club. Thanks very much, Paul. Thank you very much, Claire. Goodbye. Bye.